Hi guys. Good morning. I hope you're not too hungover. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about uh, what we sort of started talking about yesterday, which is dealing with the the, the complexities of, of packaging all the all the all the tools that Google wants to ship in 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 Google or in Google's Debian image, but in the but in multiple versions of the Debian operating system, it turns out that there's lots of versionitis and other kinds of issues we're running into. And I'd like to go into a couple of examples, and hopefully you guys can help me figure out what we need to do, either inside Google or between Google and Debian, to figure out how to deal with these sorts of problems going forward. Um, like I said yesterday, historically, when we built our images, we just like de-bootstrapped a, a, a file system image and then just copied all of our files inside, and that was suboptimal for various reasons, right? You can't update packages and so forth, and you can't remove them. Uh, it's just a less pleasurable and less smooth customer experience. We'd like to make that a lot better. And we'd also like to get those things into the mainline Debian source tree or Debian release tree, just like we were talking about yesterday, in order to maybe one day fish, or brand our, our Debian image as official. Uh, we've been making some progress on this since. Uh, when we first announced and uh, released Deb our Debian images, we've been starting to convert some of our tools. And we've actually got some nice uh, automation almost complete due to uh, Wee Nugan. Nugan? Uh, I've never really learned how to pronounce her last name very well. But uh, basically, it takes our, our once we cut a, a new release of our tool and publish it to the outside world, it goes and does a, a whole bunch of things to build a Debian automatically and, and stick it into a repository that we use to build images. OK. So exactly what software are we talking about? We're talking about the, the Google Cloud tools. We're talking about the tools for compute, tools for, for storage, and tools for other products, Quer BigQuery, and so forth and so on. We're talking about various kinds of, of software that are used just, to, just specifically to make the integration, make Google Compute sort of a functional product, the ability to create snapshots of your, image, of your disk images, things that manage accounts and manage uh, IP addresses, and things that start set up the host name and other things like this. Uh, we also sometimes want to modify configuration files like SSH and SSHD. There are some issues around the cloud where, for instance, if you don't keep your network connection active, it sometimes will time out, and you'd like to keep SSH keep alive and stuff like this to to keep the connections alive. But eh, it's not clear exactly how to do that. Um, so some of these are harder than others. Um, so, for instance, we found that packaging up our tools is, eh, we don't know exactly how to do it right. Some of the things, and mostly it's due to dependencies, we found. Uh, some things are easy, mostly because they're just simple files. They don't modify anything else. They have very few dependencies. It just needs Python, execute, or the Python runtime, things just work. And then some things are questionable, like it's unclear to me that if you wanted to modify the configuration files from another package with your package, how you might do that. That's oh, fairly, what was that, a policy? Uh, modifying a package. Hello? The modifying configuration file from one package to another is forbidden by the Debian policy. Is, is forbidden. forbidden by the Good. Debian policy. Good, so that's, that solves that problem. <laughs> Mike too. On, on another, uh, uh, on some package, you can include files from uh, in uh, the D directories. I mean, if you want to modify uh, etc sudo us, mm -hmm. you can include a file in etc sudo us D your file. Yeah. And so uh, if 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 you should ask the package maintainer to <coughs> provide something like that. So if you're saying if the existing package has a, a dot .d directory, you can add files into the dot .d directory. And Debian sometimes patches um, packages to support that because of this exact kind of use case. Yeah. And uh, I think we're using that for our syslog. I don't know if that's a patch yes. or upstream. And uh, we should probably switch to our to doers for the account management to use that as well. Yes, I would agree. Uh, in general, we love that idea. And whenever we find it, we use it. But in some cases, like SSH, I don't think that's currently done. It's not supported by the tool. So maybe it's, this is one of those things where we just figure out how to transition all the tool, existing tools. I don't, we'll talk about that later. There's a section later. Uh, we should maybe come back to that. Um, but those are good ideas. Um, let's see. 
So let's go into a couple of these examples. What makes things hard? I talked about them a little bit yesterday. I don't know if were all of you here yesterday at yesterday's uh, main talk for Google Compute. Only a few of you. Okay, good. So Google Compute GCUtil is a Google com a command line tool for Google Compute. Uh, it's a pretty simple program. It's just 100% Python, Apache licensed code. It doesn't do, or it, it doesn't need anything fancy, right? Uh, it uses uh, several packages here, Google App Utils, Google API Python Client, HTTP lib2, IP Adder, ISO 8601, and Python GFlags. These are its dependencies. Back in the day, about two years ago, we were using uh, PyPy to build this tool and suck up all the dependencies that we needed, but we found that in general, the, the Python versioning system wasn't doing a good enough job making sure that we got exactly the versions that we want of all the packages, and we were getting many support calls from people who had a system in which some module was a slightly different version because of some crazy dependency chain or something like this, and we eventually just switched over to a, a, a worldview in which we basically took the, the, the exact versions of all the dependencies that we need and we copied them into our source tree, or into, our, into, our, into our package tree, and we import modules directly from there. Um, yes, go ahead. Y you know that it's not possible to do that in Debian, right? I don't know. Uh, so, so this is this is this is this is. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible, but forbidden. It might it might be unkosher. It might be unkosher, but in general, we found that it's the only way that we can ensure the the, the stability of the product. Yeah, I mean, I, I've uh, you know, I could see, I can see both sides, and well, I mean, obviously, I you know, I, I'm wearing two hats, right? But uh, but uh, I, I, I yeah, I've, I've I've mentioned that Debian typically avoids this, but at the same time, whatever, like, the solution should not, like, we need to figure out a solution other than having an unstable product. Uh, you know, we need to find a solution that, you know, respects the reasons behind Debian's policies yeah. and also allows a useful experience for, like, a stable experience for the customers and, and users. Is there anybody here who could talk to like why I that I policy exists? I can see uh, HTTP lib2, IP ADR, ISO uh, 8601. All this is in Debian already. Yes, but so many, of them, have many other of them have versions that we have not been able to qualify against. And maybe we just need to qualify against all the versions of all these things and all the versions of Debian. But again, that increases the testing matrix and it's a, a large support cost. Um, I mean, one of the questions I might have is why would why would why would copying statically into into a single package what what the issue would so be? So there are many issues. Tell one is more. code duplication, and the main main issue with code duplication is security. When you have a bug in a package, Debian makes sure that that package gets updated. Mm -hmm. But if you have that package statically copied, then that bug is not fixed um, in your static mm -hmm. copy. And so you may have a security bug that is Debian is not able to fix it mm -hmm. because you have that copy. Unless they also fix the, all the things that depended on it. <laughs> right, and for instance, in this case, GCU right, tool depends are, on this and this even and this. Like your code is not even the Debian repository, so that's yeah, not yeah, possible. Exactly. But for packages that have copies, and those copies are in the Debian repository, uh, it means a lot of extra work for the people mm -hmm. who are providing patches to also go and, and patch all the static uh, copies. Sure. So it's, it's more, more work for security, mainly. So th I feel like your best solution here is if these libraries are in the archive, you should be able to, you should try and work with the version in the archive. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to make our Python HTTP lib2 a newer version, then you'd break other things in the archive. And if you ship your own copy of it, well, then, you, then you're responsible for the security. That works as well, but it's now your problem. It's not integrating with there Debian. There still is the challenge, though, that from Google's perspective, right, we need to make it work with Squeeze and Wheezy and Jesse and CentOS and Red Hat and SUSE and so forth and so on, right? So now we're talking like a dozen different versions of all these packages that we have to qualify against and change code to support, right? Of course. Unless you know, Debian, Debian wants to take over the responsibility, I guess, maybe of like, well, when I if somebody wanted to create a package of these things, I don't know who, but like maybe. the front desk for new maintainer? Say that again? See the front desk for new maintainer. You can do that. He's suggesting yeah. that you join Debian. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> and fix it once. The, the, uh, the 
you know, at the same time, the, the same argument about duplication of effort across uh, different operating systems from Google's perspective also applies from Debian's perspective across mm -hmm. different packages that yeah. have the stand. So it, the same logic has both sides. It's also from a customer point of view, if I, as administrator of something, when I have, uh, when everything uses the Debian packages, it means you have to test more. But it also means I, as user, only have the package once. When I have multiple copies of the package, I have to uh, make sure all of them are secure, all of them fits my needs. If I have something special, I have to fix all of them. So if there is something that duplicates everything, I'm very reluctant to use it as user because if I have a big installation, mm -hmm. it means much duplication for me. Sure, but, and I, I, I understand the issue, but I mean, with respect to this code duplication problem, right, it's quite conceivable. I could see, at least for some of these cases, the, right, the, the easiest solution for the program developers, which is not actually me, it's the other teams at Google who are building some of these tools, is maybe just to drop the dependency on the library and write a whole separate chunk of code that re recreates what happens in that library just because they can control what's happening in that code. Right? And, even, and if there's a security bug there, you're still screwed. Right? You can't update that either, independent of this tool. It's of course easier for the developer to only have to test with one version. Mm -hmm. But for me as user, most things that are easier for the developer are things that make me not use the software. If you don't have a bug tracking and no uh, possible way to report bugs, it also means it's easier for you because you don't have to keep up with bug reports. <laughs> but uh, I, for me as user, it's a sign that I don't want to use it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with duplication because it means there's multiple things doing the same functionality and if there's anything special I need, and from bigger installation there will always be something special, mm -hmm. I have to keep up with all the little different versions. And if I'm in a more complex setup, I have to verify all of them and keep the paper trail for all of them. And uh, if I have to push uh, a library once through change management, it's uh, worth enough. If I have to do it for a dozen copies, I mm -hmm. uh, don't want to but do that. But that's still assuming that this tool is using that library, right? If, if, if Google Compute Tool one day decides that, well, I'm not going to validate against 12 versions of HTTP Lib 2, I'm just going to write my own. What's that? Well, for some of these, it actually is that much, right? So for, it's not so much a problem for GCUtil. It's more of an issue for the next tool. Yeah, f just for the, the libs that you uh, for, mentioned here. Yeah, yeah, for this one, you're right. It's not that big of a deal. But for this one, some of these libraries change much more frequently. So Bodo and CRC Mod and PyOpenSSL, there are many more versions of these things floating around. Kay. And this <laughs> team would be much more likely to not validate yeah. against yeah. a thousand versions of each of these. Can I suggest we let Luciano speak? Sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. in, in the security team, there is a public file called Embedded Copies, which is basically the database of, um, of uh, packages that includes embedded copies of other packages. So when we need to patch something in one package, we check in that embedded copies and we patch all those versions too. I mean, embedded copies is a problem in Debian as a whole. And I don't see your solution that bad, I must say. A lot of, a lot of upstream uh, developers made it daily, and it is a, it is a global problem in Debian. It's, it is how it works. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, there's other possible, uh, actually the biggest thing I want to say is that you should make sure to get through the rest of your slides and yeah. bring up, raise the rest of the issues, and this conversation needs to happen. It just maybe should extend beyond this session. Um, can, yeah. can I say one comment on that, though? Yeah. Uh, just on the Boto thing. Yeah. Obviously, we have the same thing. Um, Boto ships in Debian, yeah. um, and right now it's it's quite out of date, obviously on, yeah. on stable, um, and that's something we're going to live with, I guess. Um, and I, obviously the, the the other important point is it's important for these not just to be on our images on the cloud, but our customers are using this on their own installations, on their own hardware to talk remotely to us, 
Um, so I think we need to have a copy of all of this in main. It's all free software. Mm -hmm. So it's license compatible. Um, and it's just going to be out of date, which means newer features won't be available by default. Um, my suggestion would be that we have separate repositories where optionally you could go and add that to your app sources file. We've got app sources. Uh, is it? App, what is that? D, it has so a dot D. D. There is a dot D. So you could just pop a file in there. Um, you know, that's as simple as an echo from the existing bootstrap that we've all got. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it's an extra hurdle, but but customers who want to do that can actually ta you know copy and paste a. Here's how you get the latest copy. Does any so in a, in a way that's relevant to quite a lot of the slide deck? Does anybody know much about the PPA main type proposal? I've not been it. That the FCP masters mentioned on the mailing list in May. I was hoping one of them would be here to talk about it. But if if somebody knows about you know it, you know about it. Take a microphone. <laughs> if you know about <laughs> it, <laughs> I know as much about it as you do. <laughs> um, so there is a proposal to have PPAs in uh, in Debian, which is basically going mm -hmm. to mean any Debian developer can create a private, independent. In, it's not an entirely independent archive, it's layered on top of the main archive, but you can upload your packages to it and they don't interfere with packages and other PPAs. It's not a repository so that you can upload any random version of things which are already in the archive. If you want to make a backport, you're ready to do so. I think it's best to upload to backports.dbn.org. Also, if you're going to be backporting all of these libraries to support your utility in a separate archive, you've got exactly the same problem as if you just dump them on the machine. If it breaks something on something else that depends on that package, mm -hmm. you've broken something. Yeah, you could break everything in them, like all the other stuff that's been qualified inside of Debian, exactly. right? Part of, part of the issue here seems almost as if you need to have the ability to have multiple versions of packages on a, on a, on a, on a system for different kinds of programs, right? And maybe... W balancing the needs of security fixes with different kinds of, of, of functional requirements for each of the, of the pieces of software on the machine. I'm not sure. Wookie had something to say, I think. Yeah, I was just that um, uh, uh, Ganef said he was going to work on the PPA thing um, this week, next week, so uh, actual some progress might occur. Ooh, that's uh, good. But I uh, didn't any of any useful details. We um, should probably move there's on. There's one more question. One more, yeah. Well, I if you have to maintain multi version of a single package, we already have uh, 30,000 packages. Uh, if we have uh, to maintain multi version of the same package, it will be a lot of work for us. Mm -hmm. And we will have to maintain unmaintained version because usually upstream only uh, maintains the latest version. So uh, we, uh, we try to package the latest version. If mm -hmm. we have to maintain older version, it will be a lot of work uh, for us. For, for, for your package, I am pretty sure we can work to make them work in Debian uh, as they are here. I am looking at uh, Boto. Boto mm -hmm. is uh, 296. Uh, the latest version is 299. Do you need 299? Uh, I don't know if... W I don't think the version of Boto is terribly out of date for us. I think it's pi... I think the main ones are CRC mod and... Uh, we have a very healthy, uh, we, we have a very in Debian, a very healthy uh, Debian Python uh, module team that uh, you, you can you help uh, that can help you to to package uh, the dependencies that you are missing, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we can work to uh, to be able to package uh, your uh, your tools mm -hmm. without uh, bundled de dependency. I'm pretty sure I am. Uh, I can volunteer to today to to help you do that. Okay, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, the, the the general probable outcome hopefully will be more collaboration to solve the problems within the existing model and maybe to extend the model where necessary. But uh, so, there, so he's also thinking with regard to Jesse, with regard to Squeeze and Wheezy, it may be a matter of putting things into the backports repository mm -hmm. uh, to allow people to, who opt into that uh, to use yeah. uh, those wh where they know it can require yeah. some other... Options. I mean, if maybe Google just subscribes to the backports and makes sure that all the versions are insane, but this is then that might break everything else. Who knows? Well, okay. <coughs> let's continue. <laughs> sure. So let's move on just a little bit to the next kind of issue that we have. And it's, it's a fairly similar issue. Uh, so we're not actually going too far away from the last one, right? So here... Right. This is again. I ke we've kept coming back to this slide. Wh where are the where are the version IDs is happening for us, right? And it, in this particular case, it's Pi Open SSL and, and CRC mod, and I, possibly even Sox Pi branch. I'm, I can't recall. Um, and again, all the, uh, in Jesse, I believe all uh, like all the versions that we need are there. But in Squeeze and Wheezy, which are the released and stable versions of the operating system, the versions are just too old. 
uh, the situation here in GSUtil is a, a lot more complicated because we can't even do the copying the code kind of trick to, to solve the problem, right? Because the binary dependencies, we'd have to build a version for each for the architecture that we care about, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a lot more complicated. Um, and yeah, let's just move on from here. Because I think we've, we've talked about much of the issues around this already, I think. Uh, and let's come back, I guess, a little bit to the, to the config file thing, which is another kind of problem that we have. Uh, the, and I think we had some ideas about using .d files and stuff like this to, to solve this sort of problem. Uh, yes, go on. Depending on uh, how long-lived your cloud instances are going to be, mm -hmm. um, one thing to consider is to use configuration management, mm -hmm. um, by which I mean that you actually put your changes into a central location um, and then have some daemon running in the background that enforces these changes on the local system at all times, Puppet mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, they are small uh, tools, not mm -hmm. like a whole infrastructure like Puppet, although it might be interesting to just be able to actually take that and integrate it straight with your with your whole infrastructure mm -hmm. and have the all the nodes be centrally managed. Mm -hmm. um, but the benefit is that uh, you you will somehow, or at least the Debian users that I know, would prefer to have a very exact description of all the changes that you made compared to Debian default installation. Mm -hmm. So before you create a file that says we changed root permit root login to yeah. no. Um, and we change this and we change that, put it in a form where this can actually be enforced. Yeah, I, I would agree, right? This is one of the, th the one of the problems with the approaches that I think in some ways Amazon's taking and Google is taking that the, the build image scripts, they change things and you can't tell exactly what's been changed and you can't revert it when it's after it's been changed, right? Um, the, the thing that I like about using some of the .d files and stuff like this is that you can install a package that says this is the Google secure lockdown config package and I just install that, it applies the updates to all the files, all the, it installs files in all the right directories to create the policy that you want and then you can remove the policy later and you can list it and see that it's there. But again, not all programs support that, right? And do we go and change all those programs so that we can support it? So if do we, if does cloud have a mandate now to like, that we have to go and change OpenSSH so that it supports .d files and stuff like this? I don't think it does. Okay. Um, so I have two quick th things. One very sh short. Is obviously, we don't have a, any passwords by default, so the SSH locking down isn't particularly important until people uh, create it's accounts. It's not just the locking down in the SSH. There are several other things that at least Google cares about doing. Okay. So the, 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 the other thing yep. is, as an AWS user, I'm not interested in any of Amazon's images. At my company, we use the images Ubuntu publish because we know exactly what they are. They've got everything we need. Mm -hmm and we customize them beyond that ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't need any utilities on them, we just need an Ubuntu machine. Yeah, a lot of customers that come to Google, though, want something that works sort of smoothly out of the box. Right, this works is very smoothly out of the box for us, but... Yes, yeah. but Ubuntu doesn't exist on Google Compute at the moment, and so... We'd have no problem with Debian either. Yeah, so, so while your company might not care about using tools that talk to the other Google systems, most of our customers need that. He, he actually meant smoothly integrating with the rest of the cloud platform. Yes. Can, I, can I go back to what Martin was saying about enforcing policy? Um, so what we're talking here is we're talking about policy when the machine initially boots. After it's initially booted from an AWS point mm -hmm. of view, it's your machine. And if you want to go and enable root SSH, and you want to go and enable password login, um, we don't want to enforce that policy from Amazon. We want you to have whatever policy you want mm -hmm. because you could be running that behind you know, private networks which are not internet accessible in any way, shape, or form. It's, it's mm -hmm. yours to do. Um, so that, that, I don't know if we need to, uh, it's, uh, I agree, Puppet and Chef are, are, are brilliant orchestration utilities. I don't agree with that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as it's yours, it's yours to, 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 to change whatever you want. But I think um, uh, open SSH and SSH access, I think that uh, one of the things I raised yesterday that I think is quite useful is what do we feel about having, if we're going to install open SSH into cloud images and that is your way of accessing it, what do we think about having fail to ban or deny hosts installed also alongside SSH so that um, it's, it's going to lock you out if you do uh, misauthenticate a couple of times? No one? There has to be a backdoor. A different IP address. P. 
Hey, guys. He... <laughs> I said that the best was the best was the I think that... Um, I think that I all of these... Uh, um, suggestions like including fail to ban and so on they're they're great I mean I, I can imagine that there are some people who would really like to have the carefree package and and just install an image and know that this is already tightened um, but on the other hand at if at some point if, if this is a short-lived instance then I, I don't think we need to have this discussion right but if this is an instance that is supposed to live for the next three years or survive a couple of Debian releases um, then you, at some point in time, you need to know what changes have been made. And if you make changes mm -hmm. and I make changes, I try to keep them in some sort of log file so that later on I know what when I screwed up. Um, and we need to merge those log files. And all I'm saying is perhaps the abstraction of putting it into something that can be used to enforce policy. I agree that it actually does, right? If you say permit root login equals no um, in Puppet that runs locally, um, and I make the change back to yes, and then it gets overwritten half an hour later, that's probably a problem. That's mm -hmm. a communication issue, though, in many ways. Um, but it, it before we have a redundant file that is your log file, which I try to merge with my log file of all the changes we've made to the system, and potentially, I'll grab a number out of the air now, 85% oh. of all the um, cloud instances are ideally going to be centrally managed with some system like that. Maybe the best approach would be to just enable, at least give the plugs, you know, like uh, provide the interfaces for this sort of management mm -hmm. from the start. Um, I just wanted to uh, get back to this .d configuration files. Uh, you mentioned that you do not want to update all uh, packages to support it. Uh, I have heard of a package, uh, I think it's named .d, uh, which actually allows you to um, Use dot uh, use a dot d folder for configuration, and it will then, when the program actually tries to read it, it will concatenate all of them together. So it allows you to support it even if the program itself does not. This is like a named pipe kind of program. Yeah. Um, I think it's called dot d. Uh, it's dot d spelled out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I like also to point out that over multiple clouds, we need to have consistency, meaning that. If you disable root login on the Google Cloud on what we will want to call the official Debian image, then the behavior has to be the same on AWS or the uh, image that we provide for uh, uh, OpenStack or wha whatever. I don't know. So, so, I, so I, I would be against anything that would be cloud provider specific. I would love that we have only one single image that would works for all of them and that the behavior be stays the same as much as possible. Yeah, I, w I would generally agree. I don't know if the, there are going to be differences amongst what, pol what cloud providers really want. Um, so one of the things that I, I sort of feel I hear is that there's, there's a maybe a need for a general configuration mechanism, right? And a policy expression engine of some sort that I, uh, it's sort of like a check config kind of thing where you basically register with some place that I want SSG SSH to take over this, take this flag and these flags and these flags, right? And then keep track of that, right? And ha history, and then make modifications to that via some mechanism, right? That's sort of what I hear people saying, right? I don't want to necessarily install a package that locks down the system. I want to install a policy and make that modify the existing, like combine with the existing policy in some way, to create a new policy. Yeah. And so then I think have the ability to add another one, yes. I think so that's what Martin is saying. Uh, I think what Tama is saying is that it should be done at least for the official images that are the, the default, that are promoted generally, um, not for any local customizations. It should be done in a sort of Debian consensus way with an eye toward the cloud context. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. I but if like but if we had this policy yeah. in a way that was easy to understand right. and represent, then it's they're not, they're not, not as concern. It's they're not, not as contradicting. They're not contradicting yeah. yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that if the if such a policy were were easy to understand for the customer, I don't know that it would matter if it was so much the same as it, it was just the same structure, that they can look at the policy and they say, oh, that's the environment I am. I'll switch this. Fli I'll flip this switch if that's what I want. So you were asking whether you thought the cloud had kind of the right to dictate uh, config mechanisms, and I just say that. All the embedded people have exactly the same problem, right? Mm -hmm. That you need to do some customization, you know. And uh, I'm not 
Um, and we've done it by installing crappy packages that overwrite files. <laughs> and that's what people mostly do, uh, and it's pretty crummy when you come to update stuff. Uh, so uh, the Freedom Box people have this problem in a big way as well because uh, they want to make something totally idiot-proof mm -hmm. uh, and maybe make a web interface to all the config. And we don't really have a good mechanism for that. So I think there is a good argument for better config update mechanisms, mm -hmm. but you know, probably we should try and use something that already exists. So the, the Open Work project has a really interesting config mechanism um, which integrates open, well open with the open WRT. So, but it's really different from what everybody else does, so it's difficult to use in a Debian context. Uh -huh. but, you know, that's one way of turning all your config into bits, which you can then easily display in a web interface and change that way. But you know, presumably this is what Puppet and Chef and things already do, and maybe we should just use those. And we already have Debconf. I don't know what happens when you try and use both of those together and everything breaks. <laughs> But yeah, this is not a problem unique to the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there is, if we had better ways of applying policy, and all our installer stuff, you know, um, FAI has mechanism for all this as well. Uh, I don't know how that applies. Ask somebody who you need to ask Phil Hands or someone who actually knows. Right. I think it's more of a problem for cloud because we have to show it to users and give it to them as their default image, right? And they are, we expect them to change the configuration more than I think in the embedded space. But, but yeah, I totally agree. Otherwise, what, what is cloud config? Uh, there was just an, an imaginary package name that is like, what is what is the right <laughs> configuration for cloud? Like, if if cloud configuration has to be, it should be different from the basic hosted configuration for uh, Debian, like the standard host, the CD version of Debian. Maybe you get it by installing <laughs> cloud config, but. After listening to you, I'm not sure that's the right idea anymore. Maybe we need something stronger, <laughs> right? You need something that's not just install a package. You want something that merges policies in a sane way and keeps historical logs and things like this, right? So you can roll back and roll forward and so forth and so on, right? I think that's what I feel I might want now. Um, one of the things that comes out of this discussion is that ideally the Debian system should be parameterized completely, mm -hmm. right? Ideally, all of the um, things that you might ever want to change are somewhere parameters. And in some ways, it is. We have DevConf. It's not a configuration mechanism. It's a cache. But um, it already th there's a whole lot of infrastructure behind it requiring the packages in their Postgres file to reconfigure themselves according to choices that the administrator makes or mm -hmm. that can be preceded or automatically introduced into the system. So ra theoretically, that is exactly what you need. Mm -hmm. However, um, it's been, I don't know, 12 years that I've been trying to get root permit root p um, login in SSHD to be parameterized, and uh -huh. for some reason it has not happened. Um, what, what are the obstacles there? Is it just SSHD I has to be changed? I didn't write the patch. It's all okay. my fault. Okay, so okay. I'll talk with you later. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is more that um, you're, not, you're not ever going to make it to, to find all the parameters and then to convince all the package maintainers to and put them in, and then you, you're also unleashing a whole can of worms because suddenly all the DebConf translators have to start working on the stuff that you've just prepared for them, right? So mm -hmm. potentially, that's not going to happen, at least not fast. And uh, I don't think you want to be discussing this for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, another, th and, and since we can't convince Debian to include Ruby, which is required for Puppet and Chef into the base distribution, at least I will ob object. Um, Maybe there's something much simpler that we need. And uh, in essence, I li really like the idea of the .d um, directories. Mm -hmm. And especially, um, maybe we can find a way to use that paradigm to make changes. And I imagine there's this tool, Augias, or maybe there's a uh, Clint wrote a tool called Deets, which uh, is a locally running tool. It doesn't do any network configuration. It just pulls your configuration out of Git and then applies changes locally. And mm -hmm. if you can just make it so that, if that's, I, I think that tool is very um, open to um, influence. It's, uh, it was a good idea, but it, uh, I don't think he took it anywhere near 1.0. Um, I imagine that you, you'd have a deets.d directory in etc or an SRV or wherever, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you just drop your policy files in there. And they actually get enacted. And they uh, will make the change to SSH. So the SSH file the permit updated root login by thing exactly, by and then restart the service or something like that. Now you still have the problem that um, this is enforced. If I go to etc ssh sshd config and make the change back, and then it reverts 
um, mm -hmm. 30 minutes later, then obviously that is yeah. somewhat of a policy um, violation. Yeah. Um, but this can be solved potentially with con um, comments or it's a communication issue, as I said earlier. So with any of these tools, uh, that whatever, whether it's .d or .dit or something that doesn't have D in its name, uh, we, we should... Okay. Uh, w w w w w uh, there's nothing I can D. Um, we 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 should make it so, so we we only we only want to enforce it by default, like 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 with Amazon at the I at the launch, right? Uh, and then maybe the user may want to have a way to reapply the policy, but we don't want to automatically override their choices. So remove the cron so D. Right. So w the I think the idea would be to. Um, maybe do it once at boot possibly and allow them to rerun the tool that applies it if they want, like not a daemon type thing. Okay. Um, I so I, what's that? I no, I mean, we've got a fun alley side. Right. That's about it. Right. Um, I like the idea about the, the deets like thing, the deets like policy thing, because it at least puts all the policy in one spot. I don't love the dot .d directory ideas as much because you end up in a place in which if I install a package that throws some files in there and you install a file that changes something in it some other way, right? I have to go and look through the evaluation of all these .d files, right? And I have to figure out what the heck the, this guy turned it on, this guy turned it off. I have to know the evaluation order and hopefully that's the same in each program that evaluates that their .d directory. But that's a, that's a dash dash test invocation on the deets tool, for instance. I mean, that, that just shows you exactly what is being done and you could say, dash dash what changes and then give it a file name and it tells you the uh, order of policies that are being applied to yeah, the yeah. And but like modifying SSH itself to take an SSHD directory and then he installs a package I install a package you install a package it that's that I don't love. Right. Uh, yeah, I think I'd just say um, the. I think we're a little bit fatalistic about using debconf. I mean, for some of these things, that is the right mechanism, and we should just use it. Um, but not everything. I don't think it solves the whole problem, but it, it probably solves parts of it where actually a lot of people want to change that particular thing, and we should just put it in. And that, that would actually address the goal of keeping the system as close to real Debian as mm -hmm. possible. Yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, that's a benefit. It makes it very Debian-y. Uh, on the other hand, it means it's not like anything else people are used to. So, you know, <laughs> if, you're, if you're puppet people, Debcom's really annoying, you know, but uh, it's you kind of it both ways. How does this mechanism... So I'm, I'm actually not very familiar with the, that mechanism. What does it look like? Debconf? Yeah. Um, essentially, it's a protocol that um, makes questions appear and either get asked to the administrator or um, fetched from the preceed file. And um, then suddenly you have a parameter equals value type uh, system. And the now packages when... Packages are expected to look at this thing? When the package um, configures itself and ah. runs the post in script, then uh, it is supposed to merge what it finds on disk with what is in depconf giving precedence to the thing that is on disk. I see. So depconf is only a cache. It's not the Windows registry. Okay. And the point is that it's easy for it to be, you know, the, the, the question part is translated and appears by, you know, could be uh, in a terminal or uh, in GTK boxes or whatever. So there's various front-end mechanisms, uh, depending on what's appropriate <laughs> for the situation, uh, as well as pre-configuring and translations, which is why it's quite nifty. When they say translations, they actually mean human language. This is not always clear in the technical context. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, yeah, the, the package is the one that manages its own DevConf questions, and uh, mm -hmm. it's done by the package infrastructure for the package. But obviously, it's relatively heavyweight in terms of affecting each package, and you have to put the variables in. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a bit of a slow process than just having ETC Keeper or some other magic that just does whatever we want to do to our ETC directory. It's a slightly different thing, but... This is automatable in, like, the at the installer level, for example. The concept of getting something like DEETS into Debian proper is long ways off, probably? 
very feasible for Jesse and, and backport. Okay, good. Any other quick questions? Comments? I don't know. I don't know what you mean with Debian proper. It is in Debian. I mean it's official mainline Debian, official release, whatever you might call that. It, it is. Okay. Um, it, it's just not in the base system, so it will not get installed by default. I see. I see. So you just have to add it as a package. It's in there. It okay. depends on Lua, which may be a showstopper. But um, <laughs> no, that was supposed <laughs> to be a completely objective statement, simply because it has dependencies, and then that that makes it difficult to get into the base package. Um, but uh, I think that Clint, who's pretty well known and uh, knows Debian very well, this is a very Debian-specific approach. This gotcha. is not at all like what Puppet is trying to do to be like the solution to everything. Um, but I think he's he's no longer maintaining it or no longer adding stuff to it. So it would basically someone ha would have to look at it and sure. take over, which gotcha. I think it's it's probably worthwhile to check it out. Oh, dang! Ooh. Just uh. relaying something from IRC. Peter um, reminds us that there are levels of DebConf questions that will never show up. Hidden questions for things that where you want to automate a, where you want to precede something, but that you would never really want to ask a user for it. Hmm. Uh, I think we're about out of time, so I just want to thank you guys for chatting. I'd love to talk with some of you more about Deets and versionitis and stuff like this and how we might deal with it. Um, I mean, really, it's versionite is either in for the like in the operating system or in the person who's writing the software, right? You have to deal with it somewhere. Um, uh, I wanted to just let you guys know that this week we actually are building new Debian Google Compute images. We I meant to say it yesterday, but I forgot. Uh, Jimmy and I are probably going to be doing that Thursday around noon. And if anybody here wants to like help. We can actually have you guys like run the commands and install it and send it to test and all that stuff if you want. Yeah, it doesn't uh, require being a Googler, or y you know, any DD. It doesn't. It doesn't even have to be a Gmail account. Just any Google, any Google account. Uh, you, we can. Uh, um, you can sort of see how Build Debian Cloud works. You can run it on your local laptop. You know, the account is only needed to up to uh, upload to add the image. It's you know, it's it's a really neat thing to to get involved in. Thanks.